Hey, welcome to Movies Worth Talking About. I'm John Carlos, and I am excited to be here with Eddie. Eddie, um, you and I, boy, do we love Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, we do. We so do. We really do. As I reach up for my sip for my Freddy cup. <laughs> Badass. And uh, wear my Freddy shirt. Me too. And display my Freddy stuff. Um, you know, like there's so much that's already been said. I know. So uh, all we can, if, if you've, one, if you've never tuned in before, uh, we treat this like you've already seen it. So spoiler warning aplenty. Uh, we don't really go into like trivia. There's plenty of people who could tell you the history of this. And that it's just more how we feel about things. Sitting yeah. around, talking about movies a lot. And we will be talking about this is the first in an eight part series of all the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. So uh, tune in for more, but let us talk about the first one. And I don't know about you, but I have a subject I want to start on. Oh, please. Just because I feel like it deserves to be the first thing out the gate. And that is, I think we need to talk about Nancy slash worship at the altar of Heather Langenkamp. Yes! Because <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you. I know as the franchise has gone on, Freddie became yeah. the face of the franchise. Yes. But when you watch this first movie, especially in the vacuum of it just being the one movie. Yes! It is Nancy's story. And it's also like she is the force of the movie yes and and like the the poster even this mock-up poster the poster is not a freddy no. you see a little hand and stuff but it's nancy on the poster like <laughs> so I, the, the only problem with bringing that up though is also i don't even know where to begin but it is one of my favorite horror movie performances it's my favorite final girl of all time. It mine too, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like my number one favorite female heroine slash final girl slash movie hero. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think one of the first things that jumps to mind, yeah, is how much she feels like a high schooler. Like it doesn't feel like I'm watching a. 30 or 25 year old playing young. No. They cast someone that looks the right age, that carries herself. It all feels, she feels like a kid. Mm hmm And also I was thinking about this actually, cause I know that uh, for a long time, Nightmare on Elm Street had kind of like the status awarded it that it's protagonists, you know, throughout the franchise tend to be outsiders or, you know, something like that. And I thought, well, I don't know about outsiders, really. I mean, in, in, in the sense of like, okay, I need to write a movie about an outsider, but this last screening before, you know, we started this, uh, I, I was paying attention to that and I just thought, well, you know what? I don't really see her, Nancy, having a lot of friends. She doesn't seem popular. She's not unpopular, but right. she just seems kind of like a face in the crowd. And, um, I know one of the things that made me identify with her at a very early age, because the first time I saw this movie, I believe I was in the third grade. So I was like eight years old, was the fact that she was kind of the sounding board for her other friend who's having some drama in her life. She's the one who's trying to be there to be the stable one. And um, pers I'm you know, getting very personal uh, as a closeted little boy. I didn't really have <laughs> opportunities to, uh, you know, have crushes or write love notes to my crush or, you know, or even like have posters on the wall of my crushes and things like that. So everything was about kind of like being, you know, in the background, like there for my friend, mm. kind of like I, if, <laughs> I think if I were in Nancy's position, which means, you know, like kind of like all American kid staying you know keeping a friend company and presumably at that age when i was in third grade my significant other would have been a girl and if the girl wants to like hook up and kiss and do all that kind of stuff i would put the brakes on and say 
you know what? We shouldn't be doing this. We're here for Tina, not for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but also, to, so so to kind of like have that kind of uh, selflessness, whatever the root of it is, I remember feeling close to it that way. But also the fact that I, I totally agree with you. Another thing that I think Wes Craven does incredibly well and that Heather Langenkamp plays incredibly well in a movie that for all intents and purposes was not shot in sequence, you know, as far as we can tell, they did an incredible job of like knowing where the character was. So we would know where the character was mm -hmm. because every time she's on screen, it's all about pushing her a little bit more to this person who we ultimately meet, I'd say probably by the kitchen scene where she's confronting yes. her mother. Uh, that's the big breakthrough for me. Honestly, one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Oh, I, ha I have I have a few, but that's one of my and that, let's talk about that scene for a minute. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, one of the reasons why, first of all, there's a lot of laughs to be had. In it. Yes, there are. There's a lot of laughs to be had in this movie where I'm never laughing at the movie. I'm just sort of, yeah, it just makes me laugh. And, and that scene has one of them, which is the uh, like at the end of the scene, your mom, the mom says, you really just I just want you to go to sleep. And she's like, screw sleep. And she like just tosses the hat at at her mom, and they're only like a foot apart, so it's this really mean kind of something like "fuck you" in your hat. Yeah, she chucks it at and her. Just yeah, like <laughs> and it just drops right down. <laughs> Such a I great wrote that down. Fuck yes. you, mom. Like <laughs> plop, plop. I love that plop. <laughs> you, know, you know what's great about that scene? And we'll get back to her performance in a moment. You know what's great about that scene that I and I've seen this. You know what's great about watching this movie over and over is that once it what's once it gets in your skin, you can start finding little nuance, and that and that happens with every movie. But um, yes. One thing that struck me this time is how well blocked that scene is. Right? Like you could take that scene and put it on stage where they're only, you know, playing three quarters to the audience and moving left and right and, and not up or down. Cause so much of it is like coming to her mom for confrontation and then getting pissed off and backing away and yeah. then getting up in her face and finding power and she gets slapped and she backs away. Uh huh. It's this, this pull about, aggression and defense and aggression and i'm like yeah do they even know how well they blocked this scene out right oh my god you can put that on stage with the exact same blocking and it communicates so much so great well because also there's this there's incredible prompts for uh heather langenkamp in her performance there because like I, the, before that she's she's trying to make her mother face the truth and her mother's just deny 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 so it's an effort like you call this feeling better and um, she says, or maybe I should just get, you know, get with that bottle and, you know, and yeah. veg out with you. Just and get, get good, good and loaded, loaded until I forget him. And then her mother smacks her. And then she like, you know, yeah, like you said, like just kind of like retreats. But then when her mother starts to admit, it's all because it's all in the dialogue. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, like Wes and the actors paid a lot of attention to what is going on line by line in that scene because she retreats. But then once her mother says, he can't hurt you anymore because he's dead, she's like, you knew about him all this time. <laughs> oh my God. I, lo I, I just love watching her move into her power like that. But you know what I really love about that scene is from the very beginning, she walks in, she's not even in the room yet. And she's overhearing Ronnie Blakely, her mom, Mark, oh, on the phone. Yeah. yeah. And she's talking about the hat. She's like, oh, yes, I have it in my hand right now. I don't know how she got it or what she's doing, but she thinks, you know, there's something terrible or whatever. And then she walks in and she hides it and she hides the alcohol and everything is hidden because that's the only way to protect the child. Right. And the child knows she's no longer protected. And the first thing she says is, she says, you've got to get some sleep. If you don't get some sleep soon, you know, and she's just like, I'll go even crazier. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, she starts off in her power. This was, this is not one of my, my I think one of the first moment I know where Nancy's my favorite, though, is much earlier in the movie uh, with her parents when we first see them as a family unit uh, in the uh, police station. And Nancy's sitting there talking about, um, about what was going on. Her parents are just at her, at her, at her, and they're not listening. They just want to know what you were doing, but they're really shouting at each other. Uh, he's real, cause like John Saxon does a great job performing that scene, just like looking at Ronnie Blake, like, I'd sure like to know what you were doing with that no good kid in the thing. Like, it's not about her, it's about why did you let my daughter? And it's just right. like, you know, this is like a, a, a divorced family and that this the wounds are still fresh. They haven't learned how to 
communicate and how to be on the same side, even like in the raising of their own daughter. Um, and it's just, I, I love the fact that we see her on the defensive, but she's still trying to communicate to them. She's still, you know, she's so earnestly going out, like, she's just like, it wasn't that serious. And I'm like, maybe you don't think murder is serious. She's like, how can you say, I don't take her death seriously. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, okay, okay. I love that. Zero to 10. No, oh my God, no, but okay. Also, you know me and I feel things. Yeah, that's the, that's the scene that always makes me cry because at the very end, when she just breaks down and she says, that's why we were there, mom. Christina yeah. didn't want to sleep alone. Uh, it fades out and I'm just there going, <laughs> oh God, she's a good friend. Right? It kills me. Oh, I'm so- she even strong arms her boyfriend into having to be a good friend. What yeah. What gets me about that though is that like I've we I think we've all been there where like okay if my friend had died and I'm 40 and someone's giving me that shit the response is different but there's something about your little like 15 year old underdeveloped brain processing yeah. these big feelings and then to have yeah. someone say like you don't take that death seriously like we've we've all myself specifically have been there where literally like the parents just don't understand and you're like what the fuck yeah and her like what the fuck of it all it's all it's in every like that is how a 15 year old responds to something like that and yeah that both of their parents aren't having any sympathy to the fact that you know their friend died <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to it later but there seems to be a recurring theme in the nightmare films about shitty parents um, <laughs> and it starts well, in the first movie um right <laughs> but one of, one of the main things i love about nancy probably yes. the main thing i love about nancy is I'm, 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 I don't want to raise, you know, lower one to raise another, but I am going to compare to say someone like Laurie Strode, okay. who is a very well-known, you know, final girl. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of movies. Uh, you see this a lot in Friday the 13th where they are, uh, for lack of a better term, just, you know, like an average person going through scary shit happening to them. And mm -hmm. maybe only in the last act is it kind of like a fight or flight situation. Like Laurie Strode has, you know, the smarts to like get these two kids and be like, hey, you run out of this house, you run across the street, you have those neighbors call the police, but she's not rising to an occasion. It's, you know, a certain level of self-defense. You see that with a lot of movies. Nancy, and I'm not saying this like in some massive superheroic way, but the thing that makes her different is that very early on, she wants to get to the root of it. She wants to figure out what's going on. She's not right. a passive sort of victim. Um, she doesn't just sort of rise to an occasion in the last 20 minutes out of necessity. Mm -hmm. She's learning about booby traps. She's um, actively, yeah. like she, okay. I think in the first third of the movie, she's like, all right, I'm gonna go to sleep. Right. I need you to watch me. And wake me mm -hmm. up, and she, you know, kind of goes to the to the jail cell, and that's that's already within the first third. So I'm making an active choice to be yeah. um, to yeah. figure it out, to solve it, to beat it, to understand it. Um, mm -hmm. So that by the time you get to the third act, it's it's even more of like a rage ball of oh yeah, you know, squash it. So uh, I love the fact that you know every, at every at every. God, it feels like every 10 minutes she's either learning something new or making the choice to like solve the situation. Uh, this is probably one of the best versions of like when you tell the, the adults and they just don't listen to you, but she really oh. kind of picks herself up by the bootstraps mm -hmm. and is constantly you know, with the coffee and, and, and uh, booby traps. Uh, and this idea that it's not just trying to defeat Freddy or anything, but that there is... And it's been talked to to death about the ideas of this movie and the metaphors within it about sure. fear itself or whatever whatever your inner baggage is, whatever your inner Freddy is, and learning to confront it, mm -hmm. to not give it energy anymore over you. Right. Um, right. But she's the best version of that. And uh, I, I, yeah. I adore her gumption. I adore her intention. I think it could also have to do with the fact that, I mean, I, I, I love Halloween. I love watching Laurie Strode. Um, the thing is, if we're, if we're talking about how she occupies her time on screen in the first Halloween movie versus how uh, 
Nancy Thompson occupies her screen time. If we could, I mean, even if we just logged it out mathematically, like how much time do these characters spend being afraid of their oppressor? How much time did they just kind of like wander through the mystery of it all? I mean, granted, I think maybe Lori walks so <laughs> so Nancy could run. Yeah, um, and, I and know Lori that, is very unaware of yes. the shape, you know. And I know that Wes also wrote this character in that vein because he was kind of, I don't think he ever named Lori Strode and I don't think she really qualifies for this, but he, he always, he was kind of tired of, he called, I think it was the, the blonde bimbet who would run and trip over nothing and break yes. her leg and <laughs> be incapacitated. And he wanted to kind of answer that. And uh, he wanted to do that in the writing of the character. He wanted to do that in the casting and every, and every step of the production. Um, I think, uh, oh, but I think that Nancy's also at a huge advantage, like you mentioned, because from the beginning, oh, that's another thing I fucking love about this movie, because from the beginning of the movie, th we start establishing that Tina's not the only one having nightmares. Oh, yeah. And Nancy's not the only one having nightmares, because Ron is having nightmares, it? and yeah. Rod is having nightmares. And I just, and I love the way it's just kind of sprinkled in because you get this sense that, that it's almost like a cloud is yes. starting to kind of like move into place and hover over Elm Street and, um, or uh, Springwood. <laughs> and, um, and, and it, everything, I, I, that's another thing about this movie. It's not just Nancy, but it's about everything in the movie I feel just kind of like, it's all about dropping breadcrumbs for us to follow. That's what I feel Wes Craven is doing cinematically is just, continually encouraging us to go with Nancy, certainly like on her trek, her, her detective, uh, 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 what's the worst? I don't know, her sleuthing uh -huh. <laughs> to try and figure out exactly what the fuck is happening to yeah. her even, and, and being, having the strength to recognize when someone is of no help to her and telling them, well, fuck off. <laughs> and I love, I guess mm. to bring it back to that kitchen scene, one of my favorite things, I scream out loud every time I see how I did it today. She's just like leaving the kitchen and she turns back to her mother and her mother's just like, no, Nancy, don't worry. And she's just like, that's enough. And she just mm. leaves. I'm like, now you, I always noticed later in the movie when she's putting her mother to bed and her mother's like, it looks like that she's just showered and she's got like the, the wet hair that she's going to bed with, which feels very childlike to me, even though I know most parents would probably dry her hair and everything, but it just gives her a very young look and there's Nancy tucking her in and her mother's acknowledging her strength and telling her you face things, that's, yes. that's your gift. And oh my God, okay. Heather Lillingham's performance, she has almost no lines other than like, I love you <laughs> in that scene. Mm -hmm. But just the way she's listening to her, mm -hmm. there is such a, 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 a wealth of, of vulnerability, empathy, sorrow that she can't kind of like take her mother along and fight together. Um, and all she says kind of helplessly is, I love you. <laughs> and, and her mother just kind of, you know, get, gets very, Ronnie Blakely plays it very kind of like, uh, 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 like a docile yes. and, you know, and, and, and helpless, like, thanks, you know, and, and it's, I always thought that was the turning point where, where Nancy uh, assumes it. But I think it, because, you know, sometimes when you take notes on something, things jump out at you like they didn't before. And when she's like, that's enough. I'm like, that's what you say. <laughs> that's what you say to a kid when I've heard enough. You know, yeah. that's enough. Go to your room. She should have told her to go to her room. That would have been great. <laughs> well, and there's, I mean, that, 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 that same, uh, in, not intensity, but that same, uh, when she, uh, sees that the bars are on the doors. She just comes in the door and just, mother! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time she comes back. It's after yeah. she, uh, she has the scene over in Venice Beach with Johnny Depp with Glenn. Uh -huh. And she gets to say one of those great lines, I'm into survival. And, yeah. um, and she just goes back and then, God, the, oh, the score. Anyway, I just, I just keep hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> that dun, 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 the, dun, 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 Oh my God, I love it. The tragedy but, of that, that tucking in, <laughs> that scene where she's tucking in her mom to bed. It just, it irritates, yeah. I mean, you, you see over the course of the movie, you know, how 
to pendant her mom is on the bottle and how much yes. denying what's going on to protect her daughter. But when it literally Glenn has died across the street, you should be tucking Nancy in. Like that, <laughs> like that scene just kills me. Cause when we cut to that moment, my, my first thought is always this whole scene's backwards. Like yeah. you're the parent. And again, you're the one who's, plastered on the couch you know i lost the door and you can't you, yeah i'm like oh the tragedy of her home life um yeah yeah uh also there's a she, she in, in a weird way i could almost see heather langenkamp it, like in an alternate reality doing more comedy mm, just because yeah. her timing is so great even if they're not funny oh. not they're not funny lines but just they're so perfectly delivered it makes it funny like um i forget his name the dad's character's name the officer oh L lieutenant hold on i got it yeah <laughs> lieutenant donald thompson lieutenant thompson has told the dude from scream later uh yeah like hey if, if anything's going on with my daughter you know get get over there and check it out that fucker stands on the lawn and and, and can hear glass breaking and the fact that she goes, <laughs> get my dad, you asshole. Yes. <laughs> Listen to you now. You're like, you know exactly what I'm doing. Like, there is uh, a world where she would have been a good, angry yeller in a comedy, you know. Oh, uh, God. Her timing. And even, even beyond that, I can think about uh, like three moments in her, just an exchange with Glenn when he first comes into her room and he gets in the bed. She's like, if you don't mind, and, you know, <laughs> motioning for him to get off. He does, and she tells him to turn off the lights. She's like, well, there's something we, now I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do. And he's like, it's dark in here. He says, and it's not what you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> and then oh. she, when she comes back, <laughs> when she wakes up because he fell asleep, the fucker. And she's just like, I was like, dude, was asking you to watch me and to see if I was having a bad dream. And what do you do, you shit? <laughs> she smacks him. <laughs> yep. I fucking love. I always lose it. I always lose my shit when she does that. It's yeah, amazing. It's a great scene. <laughs> she, uh, Melissa McCarthy is a comedic actress who I really like when she gets to be either in roles or in modes that allow her mm. to berate people, mm -hmm. to, uh, to really get up in someone's face. Yeah. Um, the Heat and Spy are good examples. That, and and mm. I feel like Heather Langenkamp would do well if she got to play in that mode more. Um, I agree. But between like the throwing of the hat, you know, and yeah, <laughs> no, she's great. I don't think she has enough credit for how funny she is in this. Oh my um, God, it's amazing. Um, yeah, so I don't know if we properly have, it, it's weird. I feel like even though we're talking about Heather Langenkamp and Nancy, I feel like I could just go on for two hours and just sort of go on right. about how great she is. Um, yeah. But we do need to go on to other things. But I will say one of the things I like about her too, be, you know, she, we were talking about she actively is confronting her fear. She's in a mm -hmm. very proactive role. Yeah. What I really like is she isn't, they still wrote her to be a wholly believable teenager. Right. She feels like just a smart, like firecracker of a believable teenage girl. She's mm -hmm. There are plenty of movies besides the ones where the hero just sort of happens to be the one who's last versus this versus the other end of the spectrum where they sort of are like this sort of unbelievable badass. Mm. And she doesn't ever become unbelievably badass. No. She is wholly believable as just a smart teenage girl. Mm -hmm. um, it's in, in my head, I, I think that she doesn't, she's never a superhero. No. But because of that, that's what makes her a superhero to me. Totally, totally. Um, so I, I adore Nancy. She is the best. Well, she's the best final girl. One of my uh, favorite teenagery moments of hers is in the bathtub when her mom knocks on the door and she's just kind of like, hey, right, people drown in there all the time. And she's just like, oh, whatever. And her mom's just like, yeah, I made you some warm milk. Warm milk? Gross. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> And has no problem lying to her mother because she knows she's not going to be of any help to her like after she gets that, even though she's screaming for her while she's, you know, being pulled into the tub and everything like that. 
uh, yeah, but that's another thing. Okay, because that's another thing I appreciate. I lose count in this movie how many interactions Nancy has with Freddy just because I, it seems to be every other scene. And um, it's, I mean, he's really, he's really got to focus on her because we never hear, we hear in the beginning about Glenn, uh, Rod, Rod dies relatively early, like, like Tina, but so he's really kind of like focused on Nancy. Like he's having a little extra fun and maybe, I, 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 can't, I can't explain it. I'd have to ask Robert England, but um, it seems like every other scene, it's because we're not always in her dreams. I, like I love the section right. where we go to uh, get to, uh, I'm gonna get her some help after the funeral for Rod and um, Charles Fleischer's there and they're monitoring her dreams and talking about what are dreams anyway, as she smokes openly in the, in the, the medical building. But, um, and then, uh, and then there's another moment. And then of course, you know, like, yeah, when she's in the bathtub and, then, uh, the, and, and at school. And then, um, I mean, I, I, there's, it just feels like there's countless ones. I couldn't come up with all of them on the spot if I tried. And I don't know how many times I've seen this movie. Um, and so it gives, so by the time there is a final face off, even though we haven't been there every step of the way for every kind of like toe to toe match, which could get monotonous because we've, we've been awake seeing her we've been asleep with her gone in, gone into that dreamland by the time we're going into that final dream with her where she wants to pull him out um i it, it just feels grand and epic in a way that can't be I'm, I'm saying it can't be manufactured but i think what i'm really saying is that west manufactured perfectly yes <laughs> does that make sense for me, anyway. And a lot, yeah, it comes from, and I think it's two things, his direction and her performance. Yeah. But when she goes to sleep for that final confrontation, yeah, I, she, like, she's coming down the stairs and it isn't, every other dream we see people kind of wandering into a boiler room, but she is going to do the thing. Yeah. It is a, yeah. a walk down the steps with purpose. It is performance. It is framing. It is, and it doesn't feel like all the other dreams. It makes you feel like, Oh, here we go. Yeah. Like we're, we're going with her. But yeah, and also just the fact that she's so, uh, one of my favorite teenager things about her is, you know, she goes, oh God, I'm 20 years old. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which when you're 15 does feel like, you know. <laughs> I, I wish I had a memory of that line before I was 20 years old. <laughs> right? Um, unfortunately, I only remember it the way I am now. So <laughs> <laughs> it re I think it resonates more when you're past 20 and you're like, oh, shit. Like when you're a kid, maybe it does make perfect sense. It doesn't even blip on, you know, on no. your radar. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I wasn't aware of that joke. movie. I wasn't even aware of that line when I was in my 20s when I watched this. It just, it, I think that line yeah. actually hits funnier now that I'm 40. Just, mm. yeah when was the first time you saw it um yeah i have a weird like i don't have some cool story like i was at a sleepover and i saw it. i remember my friend saw it when he was like eight or nine years old and he oh, okay. described the tina kill scene oh no but for the longest time i felt like i'd seen it where i hadn't seen it. and funny enough when i did eventually see it it plays out exactly how like i imagined it based on his description like he's like oh mm -hmm. she's on the ceiling and the guy's like reaching out and uh um i don't know if i ever really sat down and watched it in its entirety until somewhere in my teens wow maybe early teens uh -huh. i didn't really get into it until i liked it enough so that when the dvd box set came out mm -hmm. where it had like the seven titles which made you know a little the spines made freddy they made individual yeah of those in red and i actively bought one and three in new nightmare in the very early 2000s so i had to have already seen them in my teens to have mm. been a fan yeah so i can't really place like where was the first time i saw this and that i just know i started getting into them in my mm -hmm. early 20s right okay cool I, I i i already said third grade saw the first and the third, was encouraged not to see the second. We'll get into that later. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> it was by this kid in my class who was um, 
I'm not saying this is it's because of this, but he he happened to be a child of divorce. He was living with his father and his little brother. His little father didn't really have an idea of boundaries as far as like what they watched. So I got to whenever I would we would carpool with them when going to school. So whenever I was there in the mornings or coming home, sometimes I'd stay there in the evening and we'd just like watch trash. And by trash, I mean like you know Fox, <laughs> like you know Fox programming in the late 80s wasn't you know prestige and as a kid it kind of was like junk food for your brain but um and that's kind of like what freddie felt like i remember when i was watching it it was it wasn't quite as scary i don't remember feeling scared by it i just remember feeling fascinated and i remember really really liking um the gore um like or the blood because also my friend uh, freddie's nightmares I, I believe it was already up and running. And so maybe I was a little older, was I nine? I don't, I don't remember the year it came out, but I, was, I remember I saw a couple episodes of Freddy's Nightmares, tried to watch them in my house. My parents were like, what is this? And I'm like, it's Freddy's Nightmares. And I'm like, go to bed. <laughs> um, <laughs> haven't seen no, those since, want to give those a revisit. But um, yeah, I remember, uh, yeah, just uh, ha ha having an affinity for them, feeling like, a connection and then you know all these years later like finding out um among a number of them how many uh of these movies have you know like a presumably like homosexual subtext or whatever heather langenkamp said on eli roth's i don't remember what it was called it's on uh shutter his the history documentary of yes the history of horror <laughs> how did i forget that <laughs> um, they're old no i remember Heather Lingenkamp sitting there saying like her first fans who were really really vocal to her were gay men and i was just kind of like Oh my God, it's not just me. And it's because I'm gay. Okay, cool. <laughs> and I'm fine with that, you know, like whatever. Right. I was just kind of like, she started talking about like what they would tell her even just after the first movie, like why they would tell her like she was like their champion and shit. And I'm just like, wow. Okay. It's like Liza, but you know, or, or Judy or Barbara, but with horror. Right. <laughs> we're like, seriously, like, I'm just like, oh my God, the strength and oh my God, the, the beauty and oh my gosh, the you know, the, 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 you use the word gumption. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the grit, the determination, the, the seeking of truth and the, and the, and the humanity and the compassion and yeah, the, all of that, all of those values that she yeah. ends up becoming emblematic for. And I, yeah, it makes me feel like really, really proud that I was so intrigued by her for so long. Yeah. I don't, I don't have that same experience that you do, but, right, I, right, right. but when you explain that, I can absolutely see it, especially when it comes to the idea of I'm sure there are people and elements in your life that kind of create a negative energy and a negative history and, and her idea mm. of overcoming that and of not giving it any more power and going forward and seeking what's in front of you and not getting weighed down by what's behind you. Um, exactly. I am, I'm sure is relatable. It's funny, yeah, because I know that, that, that Nightmare on Elm Street 2 has so many gay themes, but I, obviously, but um, yeah, I could see that for this first one too. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's, it's 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 nice the the dialogue it's it's smartly written it's a little poetic you know her mom's telling her that you face things you know yeah. that's your gift but sometimes you need to learn like when to turn away yeah as and she I'm, grabs her bottle yeah well <sighs> but also uh, you know Glenn also mentions about I forget what culture it is that they they turn their back on the the evil in their dreams they yes they, uh, they, they, they turn the, ball the balinese way of dreaming the they, balinese you turn your back on it and you take away its energy which is more on the nose but the fact that her mom also says you need to know when to turn away too and literally the mm -hmm. defeat of freddie is her turning away from him like that's just yeah good ass writing um mm -hmm. oh hey let me tell you one more little moment i love of hers <laughs> yes it's she's still looking at him and she's like you're nothing and it's the fact that she turns her back on completely to say you're shit like mm -hmm. you they could have blocked that so she's still saying it to his face yeah but this is how little energy she's giving him now this is how little she thinks of him mm -hmm. at this point like i'm not and i'm gonna say that you're shit and it doesn't even deserve facetime <laughs> this is how little you matter right right i love it's 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 such a great sign of disrespect 
Yeah, especially for someone who's threatening to kill you slow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for you to just turn your back and be like, shit, fuck off. And it's just like, shit. and then when he tries, it, it no longer it no longer has any power, at least. Well, yeah. okay, that's actually, we're, we're, we're kind of jumping around and I like that, but it, because it makes me want to ask a question in context yeah. about the ending of the film. Yeah, let's, let's get into the ending. Yeah, because a lot uh, there's a lot of discussion around what it was, means for different people and what they think actually is happening. I was going to ask when. you. Okay, cool. Well, do you want to go first? Or do you want me to go first? Um, I want to hear what you have to say. What, what the fuck do you think? Yeah, what's your take on okay. that? Okay. This is what I think. And I've thought this for many, many years, actually. I think that what ends up happening, and this maybe this is just purely logically, um, just based off of like, well, that would happen, you know, like, I, I may, and maybe it's me just wanting the movie to make sense, but... Because um, even Heather Lingenkamp said in Never Sleep Again, she's like, nothing really makes sense at this point. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like it does to me. Oh, I should be in this documentary. But um, no, what I think happens is uh, the plan was to pursue Freddy, grab him, wake up, pull him into the next universe, and he's there. She wakes up. She thinks she's failed. He pops up, and we have, like, a great altercation in the house. We believe she's awake right now. I don't believe she's awake when that happens. I think the reason he waited so long was so to kind of, like, divert her attention so when he finally does show up at the very end, he could trick her into pouncing on him so he actually had a shot at fighting her. The thing is, he didn't know, I don't think he knew how unafraid of him she was at that point. Because, you know, fear is his power. The more fear you have of him, the more power he's going to have over you. So I think that's why, uh, that's part of the reason why she gets away the way she does. But I also think like a big part of it is, as much as she was like a target throughout the movie, I feel like the main target was the woman who had his knives, which is Marge. Yes. And I think that's, and I think when he finds her, Nancy is still asleep, Marge is asleep, and um, I don't think any of that stuff that's happening, that's why I think it makes sense that like the skull, the burning skeletal remains of <laughs> Marge are falling into, yes, into the mattress, which is, you know, just a vapor, and then becomes a mattress again, and she's slapping you going, mother, mother, and um, and her father just leaves her alone and the door shuts itself. And that's when yep. he comes out of the bed. And I'm like, okay, so we're still in a dream. That's why all this is happening. She turns her back on him and takes his power away and walks out. And I know that the ending, the, the, the final, you know, the, 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 the coup d'etat or whatever is, um, or is it the coup de grace? I don't know, whatever it is. But <laughs> the finale, final scene. Um, was played with a lot. It was supposed to end an original way. There were, I think, three or four endings floating around on various editions where you can like, you know, kind of like watch them and see what see what what could have happened there, what could happen there. But what, because it ends the way it does, what I always take away from it is what I take away from any one of these kinds of good versus evil type films is that you can defeat the evil, but only for so long it's always going to come back. You can, you can overcome it in this moment, and you should, but you never do away with it entirely. It's always going to come back in some shape or form and try to either attack you or attack someone like you, um, which is large, you know, really psychological, sociological, whatever kind of logical goals you want to put on it. But um, so I think that what ends up happening is she's still in the dream when she walks out, that's why her mother's still alive. That's why her friends are all alive and everything like that, because I think they have been killed. And um, when she gets back in the car, that's Freddie still, because she, she doesn't, I don't know, I've always wondered about that one moment where she looks at her arm to mm -hmm. see, you know, the scratches and they're not there. And she's like, oh my God, you know, and just like, okay, well, bye mother, you know, and she goes off into the car. I always wondered if her disbelief was part of like what might have given him a little window back. I, I, apart from the thing is that you can never completely, you know, find him. But I also wonder if Marge had completely died in her own dream yet. Like maybe, oh, I didn't think about this. See, talking about this shit. Um, I'm wondering if now, what if Nancy 
like wandered into her mother's dream uh, somehow. What if we're planting the seed that, you know, is going to lead us into three. other <laughs> nightmare stories? What if there's some kind of like possibility for that? Also based off of like what Glenn tells Nancy in Venice Beach. Sorry, folks, it's Venice Beach. Um, uh, about the Balinese way of dreaming and about like, you know, you, 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 you tell yourself, okay, you know what? I, I want to be in some magical land now. That's exactly what she did. She said, I want to be in some magical land. Absolutely. So she got taken there. But for whatever reason, her mother couldn't escape it. She was scared. It was another nightmare. I always imagined that Nancy woke up after that and found her mother dead in her, in her own bed. And um, because also I think the sequels check, check that all out too. But I, yeah, I always assumed that she, once she goes to sleep that for that final battle, walking around going, you know, Kruger, 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 I'm here, I'm here. And oh, one of my favorite things when the hand is in the foreground and Nancy's like right there and it just, and then it switches focus and you see, like, <laughs> she just looks and glances. Yes. One of my favorite things that happens in that fucking movie. But I always thought from that point on, she never wakes up uh, in this movie. Uh, she's not, a, we don't see Nancy awake again until the third movie is my belief. So I don't know, what do you think? Uh, I've, uh, I mean, I remember the, somewhere in like my, maybe my second time watching it or something, you know, I did fall for the fact that, oh, we're in the real world. And then you're like, wait, what? <laughs> because they do, he, okay, so here's, here's my take on it. And it's very, it's the same as yours, but you know, they, she pulls him out of the dream. Yeah. There's a kerfuffle. They go downstairs. She lights him on fire. Mm -hmm. She calls for her dad. Yeah. And it's so frustrating that he can't get into the house sooner. And I'm like, you don't, like, I know mm -hmm. you're clearly not in the picture, but there's no key. Okay. <laughs> it's, but the way they shoot it where the cops all go downstairs and then she looks around and instantly the floor is on fire of his footsteps. Yeah. And you're like, wait, you try to justify it for a second. Like, well, what if he, no, there's no way he could have made it around them. So now we're in, we know we're still in the dream. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely in the camp of people who think her going to sleep and going to get Freddy is the dream. Him bring, her bringing him into the real world is still a dream and that we switch to the fantasy and that's still the dream. Also, right. in reality, uh, you can transition from one thing to the next very quickly in a dream. So I'm fine with that. Um, right. The thing I always just find interesting is that that, that first fight um, He, she's getting up on him considerably. Mm -hmm. The ballot, you know, hits him in the thing, he falls down the stairs and, and then he gets lit on fire, which is appropriate considering that's what happened to him the first time. So I think that's- Yeah. Just um, and then she sees the, the fire, the footprints that lead up to her mom's bedroom. And that's when you, the ruse is up. Right. And, and, and one could argue why pretend that this is real and why pretend or allow in the dream world for Freddie to get his ass kicked mm. to then pull back the curtain, be like, ah, oh, it's still a dream, not at Nancy, but at her mom. Mm. But I, I, that's not me thinking that I'm just saying hypothetically, I think mm. anyone who thinks that might be missing the point a little bit because, um, I think what a great way, like in a sense, Nancy is almost the parent to both of her parents. Not yeah. just like she has to tuck in her mom, but also once they see her sinking to the bed, the way she tells her dad to go downstairs. And he, he's just like, mm -hmm. okay. Like she yeah. is so maternal in that scene to him. Mm -hmm. um, no, but it, it's in, instead of just him going, ha! Like what a great, again, from Freddie's point of view, what a great fuck you and then to like take her mom. And yeah. again, on a personal note, you burn me. You have my gloves. Um, you mentioned, you know, like you know, maybe why? Why is he going after her? Nancy in this movie? I always thought one of two things. One, it's later established that this was Freddie's house, which. Mm -hmm. eh. But two, it's that he sees that gumption in her, that spark that makes her different than everyone else, and mm -hmm. like when he's going after, like it's all kind of personal because it's revenge. But he kills Tina. You know, he kills Rod. But something about going after Nancy 
feels more personal. Yeah. Because she's not necessarily playing like along with his rules. And, and um, so I think by pretending that this is all real it is all leading up to twisting the knife in her more by taking her mom. And I think it's actually a good reveal mm -hmm. as opposed to just him going, ha, ah, just kidding. Now let me stabby, stab, stab you. Um, <laughs> Bitch. Yeah. It, you know, and, the, and the movie does focus so much on the relationship with her mom that they've established, you know, what a knife twist it is. Mm. So, um, but yeah, if the question is what part of it is dream and what part of it's reality, I absolutely think all of it's a dream. Right. Um, it also gives me such a great moment with, because, uh, you know, everything seems not only happy, but like dreamlike, cheerfully, impossibly happy. Yeah. Like the, you know, like the mom's going to quit drinking. Like everything. Is... <laughs> and she gives one of my favorite lines, and I had to write it down just so I don't butcher it. <laughs> they say you've bottomed out when you can't remember the night before. <laughs> every so, line in that scene is iconic so, to me so cheerfully just, delivered because what gonna, she's saying is a is is a is a, a sad factual thing but not <laughs> the delivery of i can can i tell you i have a problem time, <laughs> Can I tell you, I had a friend who every time we would emerge, this was like during my clubbing years, um, every time we would emerge from whatever cavern or dive we were, <laughs> you know, uh, occupying into the daylight, one of us would inevitably say, it's bright. And the other one would always answer, going to burn off soon or it wouldn't be so bright. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'd just play the rest of the scene out, feeling better feel like a million bucks. They say you've bottomed out when you can't remember the night before. I'm going to quit drinking. I just don't feel like it anymore. Did I keep you up last night? You look a little bit peaky. No, I guess I just slept heavy. <laughs> and it's just, um, so yeah, I have those <laughs> lines burned into my memory for life now. Thank God I don't emerge from uh, caves and, <laughs> and just cavernous places, you know, going like, it's bright anymore. So that, yeah. that, that, that's a good thing, but, but it's fun sometimes, you know, like in your youth. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I do want to point out since we're talking about her parents a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, I noticed, you know, like Tina's mom, you know, has this guy's, oh. like, Hey, come back to bed or what? And you're like, yeah. ah. get back in the sack. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, Nancy's mom is an alcoholic. Nancy's right. dad doesn't ever really seem to listen or take her seriously and is mostly nope. trying to find validation for being right. Yeah. Um, uh, even to a certain degree, Glenn's dad. Oh. Glenn's, Glenn's mom seems like she's got her head on straight, but Glenn's dad's yeah. a real piece of shit. And, uh, and, then I, and then I get to two and, and, and uh, is it Clue Gallagher? Is that his name? Clue Gulliger, yes. Gulliger. And you're like, eh. <laughs> then, you get to th then you get to three and and uh yeah. and i'm like Kristen's okay. mom so there's a motif here uh, yeah a lot of these parents are shit <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that i couldn't help thinking about is you know if, if freddie got burned by these parents you know one why go after their kids aside from well i like to kill kids but also mm -hmm. they burned you you know, so why, why go after, why not go after them? And I, you know, for the longest time in my life, I always thought because, you know, parents live on through their children and what a devastating thing to do. And also mm -hmm. I already killed kids. So I'm just going to keep doing that to you in their dreams. Right. But I couldn't help now that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the steam of shitty parents and, and, and I couldn't help but wonder that also if Freddie was also like, Okay, you're an alcoholic. You're a piece of shit. You don't listen. Like, mm. you guys have already kind of destroyed yourselves. Mm. You've already done my work for me. I'm going to go after your kids. Mm. Mm. That's sad, isn't it? At least that's yes. what I kind of bring to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like to bring things down. <laughs> <laughs> well, elevating you them look, at the same time. <laughs> but you look, exactly. But you look at how many times like Nancy's telling her dad something. Yeah. At least finally, the mom's like, "No, I'm going to take her to a, the doctor and, and try to get something done." Versus take her home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kills me um, when 
she's got her big plan at the end of the night, you know, and Glenn's are, the, the plan has kind of failed once because Glenn's dead. Yeah. She calls and talks to her dad and she's like, now I'm going to go to sleep and I'm going to need you to do this for me. Yeah. And the only half of it that he takes is, okay, that's good. Go to sleep. And he's uh, like, yeah, yeah. He keeps saying, yeah, 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 I'll do the thing, but he's not going to do the thing. All he got was that I've been telling you that this is nothing and go to sleep. Yeah. I just heard you say you're going to go to sleep. So now like I'm validated and I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that yeah. kills me because yeah. she believes him. But I'm, I'm sitting in the audience looking through the camera going, no, you shouldn't believe him. All, yeah. all you did was validate his bullshit. And, uh, oh. and sure, he doesn't have the bottle. Yeah. But he's still just as problematic. Um, oh, yeah. No, he's, he's got delusion on his side. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and denial. And I mean, this is the thing. Well, this whole, this whole movie, half of the, the second, sorry, but the second biggest like, theme of the movie besides confronting fear is, is denial. And it's all the parents. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, and it, it's staring them in the face when like they're escorting. Okay. Oh, because that's another favorite turning point of mine for Nancy. And it goes right into this. But just like when they're at Rod's funeral and she's in her blue dress because Wes didn't think that Nancy would own a black dress. I love that attention to detail. Yeah. So she's got this beautiful, little, you know, this kind of, or not beautiful, but just this proper kind of like church dress that's like blue with white polka dots. And, you know, that's her, her dress that she's going to wear to a funeral. Mm -hmm. But she's sitting there at the funeral and then she starts like telling uh, both her parents about like, you know, who's in her dream and, and like his, na his name is, he calls himself Fred Krueger or whatever and everything like that. And he's got knives and he was like horribly burned. And I, oh, I don't think she names him yet, but she says he's horribly burned and yeah. all of this stuff. And they just like look at each other. Yep. They know okay, something's not right. You shouldn't be dreaming about that man. <laughs> I'm surprised that they're not like just full on like, what are you doing dreaming about that man? But <laughs> just accuse her, just blame her. But, um, but I mean, there's all, they're already, okay, two of her friends have died in the last like 48 hours. And now um, she's starting to talk about this guy who they torched when, you know, uh, back when she, before she had memory. And um, the answer, I, I, I like what you said about, you know, like uh, uh, Marge wanted to get her help, but it's to get her help to, again, to try and get her to sleep. Yes, I know. <laughs> you know? I, but at least it's <laughs> something between the two parents. It, it is, but at the same time, like there it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's probably the most connected, the most of like one mind we've seen them but it's all in an attempt to cover something up. Like, I, and, but I do, I do think the mother's strength is probably in, after a lot of drinking and a lot of denial, finally taking her down into the basement, showing her the knives mm -hmm. and telling her the story. You know, one thing that actually kind of, it's the only real complaint I have about the movie in terms of like what was taken out. I know that, you know, initially like, Freddie was supposed to be much more emphatically a child molester and killer rather than just a filthy child murderer. I, I'm so, I, can I also just say, I'm sick of hearing, I'm sick of hearing people uh, in like discussions of like Nightmare talk about how like, so they changed it. And it's like, well, they didn't change it. Even as a kid, when she calls him a filthy child murderer, I knew what Marge was talking about. Sure. You know, I was like, oh, you call, if you call an adult filthy, and anything with the word child that follows, I know what you mean, you know? I know that they have dirty thoughts and they try to, you know, try to touch kids. Like, I, okay, I get it. Um, I didn't need it spelled out any more than, than that. So that, that omission I'm fine with. But the thing that uh, I'm really sad was taken out was the fact that Nancy, and I think it was shot, I believe I have the deleted scene, I can't remember, but um, that Nancy had a brother who was killed oh, yeah. by Freddy. And, her, and her Marge tells her in that disclosure, and I think they even have a reaction from Heather Langenkamp to that news. And it still works in the context of the scene, but she almost kind of like shivers and looks really like, you know, like disturbed by, you know, what, what's just happened just because she knows the glove is living under her home. But I believe that was the reaction she heard when she found out about a brother she never knew, you know, um, that she doesn't remember who got killed by this man who is now after her, which I think justifies a shudder and a, and a you yes. know, oh, oh my God. Um, and I, there's something else, there's something about that, 
maybe because, you know, I don't know, maybe it comes from having a sibling I care about. <laughs> But there's something about that that always just kind of like at just twisted the knife a little bit even more for me into like Nancy. Like now she's not only kind of defending herself, but she's defending like, you know, her brother who she never knew who had no defense. You know, nobody, yeah. nobody could protect him either. And I don't know, there's something I, I love. I just, yeah, pack it all on. I love a loaded, <laughs> a loaded protagonist. I mean you know, so that yeah. delivery scene always was interesting to me. Um, I, yeah. But I'm almost kind of glad they left it out because, you know, like I take that to mean like that each of these four kids, they each had like a missing sibling. And while that's kind of tragic, yeah, uh, I, it lets me just focus on these kids. And, and that. Okay. Okay. But I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if that ever made it onto the, it's not on the Blu ray, but I can't remember if it was a laser disc or DVD, but it was definitely out there. Yeah. Uh, and you can find it on YouTube. I, know, I've, I think I know, so too. I've watched it on YouTube in the past. Um, right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but there's a lot to unpack with the parents in this movie. Oh like, boy! I feel like we've. I mean, you could. We could. I don't know. It's it's a lot. It's it's, it it's is so frustrating a lot. to me. It's so frustrating to me because what Nancy needs mm -hmm. is just understanding, and she's not getting that from the two of them. She's getting denial. She, it's, it's not, I don't know if they're trying to repress. I mean, I guess in a sense, they thought they've, they've done it and they've repressed it. Now she's, she's sort of bringing it all back up, but it, it just kills me that, you know, um, she, her mom takes her to this dream clinic, the sleep clinic. Yeah. Yeah. You see her tossing about in the bed and clearly her problem isn't insomnia. Right. But you don't take the right lesson from that. Yeah. Even when she's coming out of the bed with the hat initially, you've got, I don't know, you've got bars on the, uh, it, it just feels like you're not listening. You put bars on yeah. the house as yeah. if the, the problem is internal and she doesn't see that the, the evil is coming from within. So yeah. I put up bars. What the fuck good does that do? Everyone seems she's it's it's about protecting and pushing away. Even Glenn's dad, the answer is like, nope, hang up the phone, unplug it. Like we're gonna disassociate oh. her dad, going like, what were you doing with that at the house of that boy? It's all about distancing. It's all about ignoring. It's not about listening. Yeah. It's not about understanding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm gonna jump subjects now. Go for it. What, just one little thing, but it's a thing that I that I, I just. I appreciated most recently, because if you grew up watching this and knowing it, you know that Nancy's kind of the star, but if you've never seen it before, yeah, you start the movie on Tina. Yeah, It's not a full psycho or scream bait and switch, but it does make you feel like this is our heroine yeah. to a certain degree. Uh, so yeah. I do like that they, they kind of, because also she does feel like, they cast someone who's got presence. You feel like this could be your star. Yeah. And she's already had. I love Amanda Wiss. I, I love Amanda Wiss. So, totally. Yeah, she, uh, she's great. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this movie's full of just little nuggets of goodness that even, even without being like a major theme, but like I love, you know, like T uh, Tina wakes up and there's very much a focus on the cross above her bed. And I just, you know, because yeah. I remember as a kid back when I, you know, believed in that sort of thing that like you know i go oh, the cross above is you know it's going to protect you you know and i just love this, mm -hmm, this very mm -hmm. childlike idea of, of no that cross will not protect you here yeah so much so that i think with nancy's dream like it comes down and she puts it back up yeah but yeah the fact that like freddie knocks it off um you know oh god and whether that's tied into no this is god you know um <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I love any time that the things that are supposed to make you feel safe aren't uh Mm -hmm. um, another little thing. Can I tell you a little thing I noticed this time that I never noticed before? And there's no, yeah, there's no I, I haven't uncovered a secret. I just went, huh. When <laughs> Tina and Rod have just finished having sex, mm -hmm. um, and he mentions his nightmare, and she's like, wait, 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 mm -hmm. you, 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 and he's like, yeah, yeah, you know, I can have, I can have nightmares. Got, boys can have nightmares too. Yeah. He pulls up this like blanket. And it's underneath the blue sheet. It's mm -hmm. a fucking red and green striped blanket. 
And oh, I didn't notice that. Hold up, pause, rewind. There's a red and green blanket. And then what's fucked up is when Tina wakes up and everything, it's not under the bed in the very next, in the continuation of the scene. And I'm like, oh. I just imagine that because it's not there. And up, sure enough, it's only there like when he like gets ready for bed. Yeah. And I don't know if it was just cold that night and they weren't meant to see it. But I like to think in some weird fucked up way, if you want to justify it as more than just an accident, is like that Freddy was already on his way there. Right. Yeah. Um, it doesn't happen in any other scene because the cool thing would be in every scene you have a hint of red and green before someone falls asleep. And they don't do that. I think it's just oh. a fact. But it is literally red and green striped. Oh my God. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that also brings me to Robert England because one thing that's really interesting about watching, oh God, I, okay, I have to share this. I got into an argument that still recurs to me, or occurs to me, it re recurs, it, it happens over and over again. Um, with some guy, some know-it-all at my job a few years ago who claimed that um, he had seen Nightmare 5, so, and then he had seen the remake. And because he had seen both Freddy's, Jackie Earl Haley therefore was the better Freddy. And I was like, you've only seen part five? And he, and he said, yes. And I was like, uh, uh, see the first one. <laughs> mm -hmm. You saw Jackie Earl Haley's first movie, see Robert England's first movie. He's like, but I've seen it. And I'm like, no, I, he's like, no, I, that's like, and I just thought like the hubris of like, but I've seen a movie in that franchise. So therefore I've seen them all. So I know that that actor right. in, in, in all of the performances, that's the level that we get. And that's the version of this character that we get. Oh. Real, it still irks me. I was, I've been thinking about it the last few days while I've been prepping for these uh, pods. Eddie, and, yes. don't give it the energy. Just tell it you're nothing. I know. I, shit. <laughs> you're shit. Turn your back I didn't on give it. him any more energy he kept doing dumb shit like that so i didn't give him any more energy after that but it you know memories memories are sometimes memories are stronger than an actual presence in a room an actual presence in a room is easier to deny than something that is housed inside me but you're right it shouldn't live inside my body rent free anymore so i'll i'll exorcise it but anyway the the reason i bring it up is because one thing that i like about seeing robert england in this movie is uh because he isn't at the center of it. He is, I mean, they didn't even know that he was kind of one of the components of the movie when they made the sequel, you know? We'll get mm -hmm. into that later. Uh, we don't have to talk about it at length, but, um, but what, I, what I love about it is he's not a blank slate, but he also isn't like fully realized in the way that like when you talk about Freddy Krueger with people like, I don't think many people get an image in their head of the first movie, Freddy, at least not um, beyond like some iconic moments. But I think like the character as a whole is constantly shifting in his voice, is constantly shifting in how much of him you get to see. And even like the way I have a very specific picture of Freddy Krueger in my head based off of the sequels. In the first movie, I feel like he's always, he always looks a little different and I think it's also because of the way they should because of Wes shot him very mysteriously I think about like the first kind of real reveal if you can call it that when he's got his arms out at the yeah. end of uh that alley and you just kind of see the grin yep. like the hat is there and it's shadows and it's just a <laughs> and then later and then when he pops out of the tree this is probably the most uh, uh consistent look I get from him is this weird impish yeah, but it's also, it's, it's like a whiter smell. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. right, right, right. it's the same thing, it's the same kind of expression he has on his face it's when he's approaching. Confused. Yeah, it's like when he's approaching uh, Nancy for the first time in the boiler room, he's like, I'm gonna get you. Mm -hmm. And he's just grimacing at That's her. It's really, yeah, it's like. come up? Yeah, it's, and it's, it's, it's creepy as fuck, it's less, like, ooh, powerful Freddy, and more just kind of like, ew, get, your, yes. get away from me. Um, stop <laughs> jutting your tongue out at me, you piece of shit. <laughs> You're a perv. Go away. I don't One like you. <laughs> I like about that, that, that version of him, because I, I think you're right, maybe publicly people, when they think of Freddy, they think of three, four, five, and six. Right. Um, I still always think of this one, though. Mm. Um, 
I, and one of the things I like about him, especially in this one, uh, you, you, they talk about like an it. Mm. How it needs to like it needs to marinate first. Like it needs to scare you before it 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 right. kills you. Right. I don't, he doesn't have that, but he absolutely is scaring you before he kills uh-huh. you. Yeah. Um, but it never feels like it's part of the deal. It's a requirement the way it is a requirement with it. I just simply think he's a prick. Yeah. Um, he's playing with his food. <laughs> and he likes playing with his food. Yeah. Yeah. And that to me is, is and, I, and I mentioned this before with, um, God, what movie were we talking about? Where like I was saying that, uh, oh, we were talking about Tourist Trap. This isn't the same thing, mind you, but. In Tourist Trap, the thing that gets me is that this doesn't make sense and that you can't reason your way out of it with someone who's that gone and who doesn't operate. And in that same way, the fact that he's sort of playing with his food, he's, he's like a bully. There's something playful mm-hmm. and mean that you can't logic your way out of it. Mm-hmm. You, you can't explain and talk your way out of him not killing you. There's too much glee. Yeah. But yeah, there's so many things that in the later movies, it just becomes these sort of longer drawn out kill scenes. But there, there is less uh, like, let me just do this. You know why? Because it's freaky and weird and it's scaring you. And <laughs> yeah, fun. yeah, the, you know, yeah. and, and, and that just, laugh, the little like, maggots coming out. It's all. About, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's. But I, lo- yeah. I, even, I even love the inconsistency of like his sound because it makes him feel more like um, a nightmare figure and less like a character about because like that, that there's that laugh when she pulls his face off that I you he he never sounds like again ever in the entire franchise is that <laughs> yeah and that nobody would if somebody asked you to laugh like Freddy <laughs> and you did that most people would probably yeah. be like what, what the fuck are you doing <laughs> yeah. and why are you doing an impression of the hyenas at Disneyland but there's um, a pretty consistent laugh later in the series but yeah yeah right but um and even just like his his voice, like it, it 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 always stands out to me when I revisit this movie because again, I think even as a third grader, what my idea of Freddy largely became, you know, Dream Warriors Freddy, and of course the Freddy, <laughs> Freddy's Nightmares uh, Freddy, which was already that you know that deep voice. Yeah. I'm hey everybody, I'm Freddy. You know whatever. I, I'm not gonna do it good, but um, but in this movie, there's a lot of times where it was like, Tina. You know, it's just like this tiny little, and there's actually moments in other movies we'll talk about when we get there, um, or one other movie that I can think of where we still kind of get that, where it's not, I don't know if it's a vocoder or whatever it is that they lay over like the tracks that, you know, record his dialogue, but that give him that extra kind of like, you know, uh, push, Oh, you know, like that, that reverb. The last <laughs> scene where he's coming out of the bed and he's talking to yeah. Heather. Yes. Very, like, it's a much yes. more register than the rest of the movie. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 they've definitely, I think, tweaked something. Oh, yeah. And it even, I mean, it's all over the movie. Like, there's another moment where, when the, I think the moment I notice it the most is when he is chasing Nancy into the house. She's climbing the stairs. The Bisquick is there. Mm-hmm. He breaks through the window in the door and puts the uh, uh, Tina face on. It's yeah. just like, please. Nancy, save me from it. He goes, Freddy. And I'm like, there's Freddy. Like, as I recognize him in yeah. mainstream pop culture, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's what the Freddy on his album and on his 1 800 number and, you know, like all that kind of stuff. That's right. the Freddy it's, we know. Yeah, the Freddy we know I, I, is to me just a two word impression, which is die, bitch. Like, right. <laughs> I'm scared, but also, like, <laughs> but because he's so not really clearly defined in the movie, I feel like he's allowed to be a little bit more malleable in a way that is still effective. Like, there's, I always think about the body language after he does this. Oh, because even that line, this is God. And then the next thing we see, somebody who looks like they might be a head shorter than Robert England with a much longer torso, doing this run. Oh, I just hit my yeah. light. Just doing this run. At her and everything like that and then so robert england can be there and like you know and cat and uh scare her and she has to go run into her backyard again um still effective i don't watch that oh, and go yeah. like go like that's not freddy i'm just like oh shit that's creepy even now yeah i was talking to my cousin uh joey about it 
maybe like within the last five years at some holiday function. It's a full grown man, my age, big guy. You'd think he wouldn't be intimidated by anything. And we were talking about movies that scare us still. And he was just kind of like, Nightmare on Elm Street when he's running down the alley. Holy shit, no, no, I can't look at that. I'm like, are you <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I mean, I know it's scary. I agree with you, but you still can't look. He's like, I don't know. And he didn't want to talk about it. Interesting. He was so disturbed by it. I was like, okay, this is the shit of nightmares. So nice. yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, also, I just want to put on the record that even though uh, out of, because I, okay, so I recently watched all eight uh, at the Frida Cinema as a fun yes. for them. They did a marathon of all eight. You had to stay awake and watch them all, which is what spurred me to be like, you know what? Besides enjoying these movies, it's put me in the mood to talk about them. So let's do this. Yeah. Um, but it, it, you start to see a lot of movies where someone comes into a boiler room and, and yeah, it's a, yeah, it starts to all kind of blend a little bit. But that first movie, there's a lot of really specifically good shots and choices of hands and scrapes or just hearing a thing and just a silhouette going by. Like every, uh, the first movie, it is very meticulously chosen, the, the shots. Yeah. The shots are. Yeah. Um, so good. Uh, that's all I'm going to put out there is, is there's a lot of good tension too, where they really do allow someone to enter a scene and wander and wonder. Yeah, yeah. And we kind of lose that a bit in some of the other movies. And we, actually, we do get it in some other movies, but none of them are as effective as, as this first one. Um, and they do such a great job too of, of, you know, the dream transition sort of, where like Nancy is dreaming. And I love that like, she's asked Glenn to keep an eye on her, but she's dreaming and she's like, yes. Glenn, and he just sort of leans out from the bushes and is like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> she leaves her house. We cut to her going down an alley. The alley has a door. She goes to the door, just leads to the police station. Yeah. And sure enough, when she's leaving, she like leaves and goes through the alley up to the house again. But that sort of mm -hmm. dream logic of geography, like it, the movie does a really good job of communicating that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree. <laughs> oh, I also think about um, establish. I mean, from okay, from the get go, of this movie with the opening, um, we're, we're I, I love I, I know I love how disorienting it is because even as I'm watching it, I don't know exactly what it is I'm watching. I can really appreciate. I always kind of put myself in the mind of somebody seeing this for the first time, who you know, who doesn't know who Freddy Krueger is or what his story is. And just thinking about what it must have been like to sit in a movie theater in 1984, not know what you're in for, and just see, you just hear that the, those those tones that, um, oh, I can't remember his name. Who wrote the music? Wait, I wrote it down. Uh, I don't know. Charles Bernstein. I wanted to give him his props. Thank you, Charles Bernstein. He gave us the theme, but he also gave us like the, the dun, 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 dun. I mean, all of it, all of it. Um, I appreciate all of it. And that but title. Just those, the... Yes. I mean, just, um, but just those opening chords and just watching these like grimy hands piece together this like instrument of torture and one, and you feel like, you don't just feel like you're in a boiler room. You do kind of feel like you're in hell. It's, it's yes. terrifying. And then the, yeah, the boom, like you're like, okay, suburbia is no longer safe, bitches. And so much then, so that yeah, I, I had this this sort of sense memory of, of watching it like as a teenager, yeah, and, and feeling unease because I'm like, is is this hell? Is he dead? And then you realize he's still making it while he's alive. In yes, but it feels so yeah. much worse. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and then right. um, and then the introduction of oh, and we always talk. Well, we don't always, but I always bring up. I feel font. <laughs> That's not, that might be oh, my only other criticism for the movie the kind of goopy bubbly you know <laughs> font that the, the, a nightmare on elm street's great but then once we start getting to like starring heather lincoln camp it's like starring heather lincoln camp they look like balloon animals or something you know it's a little silly <laughs> and it kind of bugs me <laughs> written and directed oh. by wish Craven. you know it's just okay so <laughs> that bugs me uh, but luckily uh, the atmosphere that's being set elsewhere in the screen and now i wouldn't have it any other way like i think i used to watch yeah, it and kind of turn my lip up and go like they should really change that font but now i'm just like it was 1984 it probably looked disorienting I mean, or something but what i love about that i've never even had a problem of course not but what i love about this sequence 
is uh, yeah establishing tina um having her just like wander around this boiler room and that first i think the first time we hear freddie and i never thought of it as freddie i just thought about it as like an, something uh, disorienting and, and that means you harm or that at least wants to see you on off your game unsettled and scared is when she first sees the lamb and, it, yeah. and everyone's waiting you just hear that i think for the first time you're like <laughs> And so I lied, you do hear it one other time. You do hear Robert England kind of laugh that carnival barker, yeah, yeah. you know. Okay, so twice. Yeah, so twice. Um, but, uh, it's, but it's all about just kind of like, just making, I don't know, making you uncomfortable. I, I, it stuns me that so many people turn the movie down because they thought that, you know, it's not gonna be, people aren't gonna be scared of it because they're, they're gonna think it's dreams and, you know, and they'll, and so they won't be afraid because you can just wake up. And I'm like, are you kidding? Like, I mean, maybe it also helps being a kid growing up in the eighties, but my nightmares as a child, thank God I don't have anything that affects me that way as an adult. Mm -hmm. Like my fears are, your fears change. People made a bunch of jokes when it chapter two was being made. They were like, well, how are they going to make that scary? Like if they're all grown up, I mean, like, <laughs> what are they going to be like your mortgage you know <laughs> or, yeah or your spouse is cheating on you you know like what are they, I mean, like your fears change you know like oh your blood pressure is up you know like what <laughs> um because your fears change when you get older so a lot of people walked into that movie very skeptical about like uh you know what, what was gonna be scary to you and we you we know we won't talk about yeah. that movie but for nightmare on elm street i hope it's not just nostalgia that um makes me understand exactly what was scary about it and exactly why it works because um even if you i've had dreams where even if i know i'm in a dream i'm still desperate to get out of it if that makes any sense you know it's like something is it feels like something's in the driver's seat and i'm not so you put the, that in the hands of like a sadist who like you know who who just wants to see me terrified yeah I I, uh, I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's scary. <laughs> it's really scary. And oh, so there's that. But um, uh, one other thing, uh, you were talking about uh, the parents and everything like that. Um, there was a moment that was kind of on par for me with uh, Heather Langenkamp's performance. Because um, the movie's about her, so we can keep coming back to her. Yeah. But um, uh, it's it's in her interaction with her father and it's the beginning of that phone call you were describing where, you know, he just does this, yeah, sure. Um, but what killed me, that this is something I noticed for the first time this time, I think I always noticed her tone, but I didn't notice that the first two words she says to him are, hi, daddy. Yeah. And it's so heartbreaking because the language is that of, you know, a, a, a carefree all American daughter. <laughs> right. But um, well, at least those first two words, but the lines that follow kind of show her hand a bit more because she's the, the next line is, I know what I know what happened, or I know how it happened, one of those. Mm -hmm. And um, but there's again that incredible quivering vulnerability but this willingness to press forward that comes through in just those first few lines when she's on the phone with her father. And the fact that, the fact that he can't even recognize it, number one, because he's on the phone, but number two, because he's not paying attention to her. Like you said, nope. he just wants her to go to bed. And um, yeah, that, 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 that was another thing. I, I was just kind of, I feel like I spent the whole movie kind of going, yes, this is why. Like, right. <laughs> this is why I'm so, close to this franchise and so close to this movie in particular. I, I really adore it. It's actually almost, some could argue it's unbelievable. To me, it's actually just more frustrating. This idea, at least frustrating for Nancy and for anyone, yeah. that, um, you, you know, Freddie, it, it's not as simple as he kills you and you're, if you die in your dream, you die for real. Right. There is a, a physical effect, which is, you know, uh, if, if he's picking Tina up in the real world, she's picking Tina up. If he's gonna be tying the bed sheets around uh, Rod's neck, the, the bed sheets, yeah. we don't see, we see in the real world the way it looks. So there's always a physical effect in the real world, so much so that she can get a fucking phone call and a fucking tongue and I'm your boyfriend now. Um, right. So Rod's awake and he could see Tina being killed. 
Glenn's mom comes into the room and sees this. So it's very frustrating to me that the adults can see blood all over the wall. And and yeah. Nancy can say, like, I know how it happened. And the dad mm. doesn't piece it together. The fact that, like, a doctor and a nurse and her mom can see scratches on her and a fucking hat in her hand. Yeah. And still, like, you know, I, I could see your, your casual non-horror fan going, but she pulled the hat out. How come no one says anything? Well, the blood came out. How come no one says anything? You know, I'm like, no, that's the, that's the point. Yeah. This is how desperate things are for Nancy that like no one, even when faced, again, there is a big theme of denial here, even faced with actual cold hard evidence, people are still denying yeah. because the truth of it scares them into having to confront something they don't want to confront. Yeah. Which all again, her makes her all the more the hero of the story. Yeah, I was gonna say one of her, that, that, that's one of her many strengths is just her ability to recognize like who is going to, who's on her team and who isn't. And unfortunately, those who are on her team keep getting like, you know, kicked off. But I love, yeah. I, oh, I started to say when she's in her blue dress at the wedding, one of my favorite shots of Nancy in the history of the franchise is just um, everybody's fretting. The parents are all kind of like glancing at each other, mm. you know, like with sorrow, but also like with a kind of quizzical look, like they don't quite know what to make of what's going on like should we talk about that I get oh no it's probably not the right time <laughs> and then there's just this one shot of her among all of these people glancing at each other you know not knowingly but just kind of you know bewildered there's just her looking down and then there's just like this look up she just kind of looks at I guess the casket and it's just she's just got this determination on her face and it's just and the, and the wind's kind of like blowing her hair a bit and she just looks like a fighter. She just looks yeah. like, like I'm not. I'm no longer really worried about her, um, which sounds naive. Uh, right, maybe I don't. I don't know to succeed. I'm totally her. rooting for. Her. I'm just. I'm just like yes. You yeah. get it, darling. Don't let anybody. I, it. It just gets me on that wagon. That like that um, encouraging. You, I feel like she's my friend at that point. Like if she were to come to me and just be like, all this weird shit's going on and I don't know what to do. I just be like, darling, you are right. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. fun. And I connect to her like that much that it's that um, it started off just liking her um, just cause she seemed like a nice kid when they were all walking down the sidewalk, you know, <laughs> yeah. talking about their dreams and stuff. And um and because she's going to be there for her friend. And then like watching how much she fully recognizes the weight of what's happening to her. Yeah. And then uh, like just with, you know, in that room in the, in the police department with her parents. And then like how proactive she is about like trying to figure things out and finding out. And also, again, establishing the rules, I guess, because it's, it's, it's established early on that like um, when she, well, I think when she falls asleep in the classroom, she burns herself on the pipe and then she looks at the burn later and it worked. Like she actually carried a wound in her dream into the real world. Then I think the next thing that happens is after she gets Glenn out of her room and she starts to call for him, Freddie has shredded a pillow in her bedroom it, we haven't seen anything when she woke up, but then just as she's like calling Glenn and realizes he's gone, she sees a feather drop, yeah, like onto the windowsill, and it's like, and and then the next, I think the next level is the hat. Um, so it, we're just building again, like just like building slowly this set of like breadcrumbs for us to like finally believe that when she's like, I can pull him into our world where we're all like yes you can because i saw the feather and you got burned and that and you and you pulled this hat get him and, and just you you knock the fucker and we got it <laughs> and i'm yeah. like yes this is you're, the language of a champion I'm, you're the jock in. you know <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so you have a bat laying around or something i love her i absolutely adore her and um oh in addition to the font one of the things that i used to kind of like be over as a kid was Ronnie Blakely's performance. I thought it was a little, I, I remember I used to think like, uh, I, 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 I wish there could have been like maybe somebody who was matching Heather Lingenkamp in her energy as far as um, I guess like a, a level of authenticity. One of the things I've come to appreciate as an adult is Ronnie Blakely's melodramatic 
yes. take at times. Yeah. Um, she's got some of the most memorable lines in the entire movie. Absolutely. But but even when she's not speaking, we go back to the kitchen scene where it's just when <laughs> when she starts charging her mother the first time, I think, and she's just like talking to her and she says, Fred Krueger, mom. Fred Krueger and Ronnie Blakely. She's not even, she's in profile. You can't even really see it, but she's doing all this. You know, this holding herself, just like, no, no, it's not real. It's not real. You know, it's her inner monologue and I am living for it. <laughs> it's just, it's so, and it's, but the thing is, it's, it's true camp to me because yes, it's a little theatrical, but it's also when it needs to be exactly where it needs to be like when she when she's finally in that bed and nancy's finally talking to her she's fine you face things i'm like you see your daughter you know exactly who she is yeah. now i don't want you to die mm -hmm. like you're not <laughs> you know? the best parent but you no. at least you see her yeah it's hilarious watching you stumble in when you hear her screaming and you just like your your oh, yeah. your hair's all your your robe is only half on you're like I heard you scream. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'll I'll take any of it. Just like lock, lock, lock. <laughs> just like give me the key, mother. I haven't even got it on me. <laughs> I can't. I wouldn't have it any other way today. Uh, I'm so glad that she is in that movie. <laughs> not as 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 well regarded as as Nancy's mom, but I want to tell you my favorite moment. Or not yes. my favorite moment. My, the, one of the funnier moments. It doesn't come from her mom. I forget the actor's name, but he is uh, he's the sheriff in Scream. Oh, uh-huh. And and uh and and Lieutenant Thompson has already told him to, you know, stay out here, keep an eye on the house. If you hear my daughter, you know, go check it out. Sure. I think it's the second time she breaks a glass and screams out the window that he goes, Yeah. Maybe I better go tell the lieutenant. <laughs> 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 you yeah, think? There are wonderful little hiccups. Not you fucking hiccups, dope. But yeah, like like humorous hiccups. Like, oh you know, my pleasant, god, pleasant little cobblestones for you to kick, like yeah. down the road of this movie. The other one is like after Glenn has died, and the two uh, 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 paramedics are bringing in the gurney, and somebody says, "I just hear the voiceover. I don't even know if they're actually saying it on screen, but somebody says, you 'You're not going to need a gurney. Better off with a mop.'" <laughs> <laughs> so insensitive but so like yeah we see this kind of shit all the time <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, it puts me right in the mind of yeah like it's uh, just daily practice for paramedics <laughs> can i tell you my favorite shot what 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 no because you were talking about the, the funeral scene just made me remember my favorite shot in the movie it's so simple one of the things that bothers me when i watch movies is when there is a single character in the frame oh and you've set it up so that it will be it, like something is going to enter, and I already know something's going to enter because oh. you framed it as such, and I can yeah. handle it. And you've now ruined whatever you're going to have. Right. This is one of the best versions of that. It's when Nancy, for the climax of the movie, goes into the dream, and she thinks she's woken up. She mm. thinks she failed, and she like gets up and she sits at the edge of her bed, and the way she's seated, she's almost center. And I know yes. I've seen the movie a hundred times now that I know that Freddie's going to pop out from behind the bed. Yes. But I also know he's going to pop out to the side of the frame, but closer to center, you know, and the fact that she's already so centered, they shoot it that it's, it's her disappointment. They don't shoot her off to the side with this big empty space. No, no. It feels like it's her shot. And then what's yes. great is he jumps up in the frame and she recoils to the side and mm -hmm. makes it a two shot. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and it's again, it feels like theater where she she recoils to the side because we're yeah. creating, we're telling we have a proscenium and we're telling. Yes. On, on, a, on a horizontal plane, we're telling a story. It's great. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Um, I, I also one little note that I just wrote, I just wrote down a note. So I don't have that, but I think it's great that when they're talking about bad dreams, and I think it's when they're walking towards the school. Yeah. Um, Glenn says, 
maybe we're going to have a big earthquake. They say things get weird, real weird. Mm -hmm. And I hope to God, you know, Wes recalled or watched that line when he wrote New Nightmare. Because when I watched right. it now, I'm like, oh my God, earthquakes. Yes. This, this is going to pay off six movies from now. <laughs> yes. You know, the way I watched it uh, all the way through after my initial viewings uh, in like third grade, uh, I revisited the franchise, I believe, I, I, I guess when I was 14 or 15. And um, my sister was probably around 12. She was finally willing to watch horror movies with me. And she was willing to watch the nightmare movies. So we started at the beginning. And yeah, we were renting them. And I think, actually, it, she might have been 11. I might have been 14, because it might have been like right on the heels of New Nightmare's release. And then it was going to be released on video. Because we did get to rent that. I remember that. And it was like in the new release thing. And we were all excited because it was the new Nightmare movie. You know, it wasn't just new Nightmare. It was the new Nightmare. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so we had all of that. All the lore and everything was like so fresh in both of our heads. So anytime there was an homage or something akin to that, we would just kind of like have a little yippee. Um, and I think she was the one who pointed, because she has such a director's mind. She was the one who I think pointed out to me. Remember when they were talking about earthquakes in the first movie? <laughs> and I was like, no <laughs> but thank you were they she's like yeah he thought there was something weird going on. like oh my god that's so creepy we were also yeah. still reeling from the northridge well we yeah. call it the northridge earthquake because northridge was hit so hard it, it right. actually have shots of that but we'll save that when we talk about i still Nightmare. call it the northridge earthquake yeah 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 totally um but yeah i, I, I love that i only have two little things yeah before i wrap up mm -hmm. uh, well closing thoughts and then just one little thing i really i want to just briefly touch upon johnny depp and what an interesting character glenn is to me yeah that he he isn't they have an interest, he isn't some overly protective overly heroic boyfriend he mm -hmm. is a total useless shit but there is something kind of like loose and kind of passive and very, and very not passive but kind of like huh whatever huh oh hmm about <laughs> even in their even their relationship before the scary stuff happens you know um right but this idea that you know she uh it's one thing the first time she asked him to stay awake and maybe you don't necessarily believe everything she's going through yeah but as the movie continues and just like oh we're gonna have lunch in venice beach and uh, what's that what are you, what are you reading like you're, <laughs> staying, you're staying up all night you're staying up all night and you're just like Oh yeah, well these people. Have you heard about what they do in dreams? Hey, what you read? Mm. Yeah. So much so that like, I wanted to stay up all night and, and look at Miss Nude America, but like, what? It's my girlfriend? <laughs> Fine, yeah, I guess stay up all night. <laughs> God, like, he he. It, it, I I find it, it's 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 refreshing that their relationship is not written and performed to be so quote unquote boyfriendy girlfriendy. Mm. I mean, he does come into her bedroom and stuff mm -hmm. but you know she asked him to keep keep watch and even in the dream he's like what yeah i'm, I'm, yeah, I'm staying awake right, right. but it, it's the fact that like you know she free oh hey i heard you freaked out in class today like right no, yeah. oh my god are you okay and i'm like do you know i feel like you should care more but maybe you guys have this relationship where that's your energy and mm -hmm. that's how you express things and she knows that's how you express things but i mean you're literally she's got bars on the window and just like you know hey we're making jokes about like you're all boarded up in there. Like, it's just, it's a weird, it's not necessarily bad, but it's certainly not normal. This yeah. sort of <laughs> depiction of like a very chill boyfriend energy. Oh my God. And when you, well, look at, when you look at how aggressive she is in pursuing the truth, like, yeah. I mean, she, she's I just mean, kind of like, all right. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that makes him a good, I guess I, I think it makes him a good choice for a high school boyfriend for her because he's not the be all end all. He's just kind right. of but he's not a total he's, shit. you know he's he's no he's just decent enough. Like he respects yes. her boundaries. He still you know likes to kid her. But the key for me with Glenn was always just I always I always and I think that maybe this is just because you know like I'm attracted to men. But <laughs> the key for me even as a kid, I remember when I'd watch it was just kind of like the oh when I experienced when he's uh, at the window talking to her on the phone. And uh, she says, that, and, if, and if, if it's not real, then I'm crazy and y'all can relax. And just like, oh, you're crazy for sure. 
Mm -hmm. I don't care. I love you anyway. And I'm like, oh my God. Well, like, that's what sells it to me is that this is this is the rhythm of their relationship because yeah, like, and also what I dropped. Right, but I always like that. Like, well, if you're not going to be of any help, at least you're not an impediment to her progress. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from falling asleep when she asks you to stay awake, yeah. but she slapped oh, the shit I out love, of him for that. We talked about this. I love how mad she gets. Oh, it's so good. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, he's he's an interesting character. It's also I I feel largely kind of due to his interpretation because I know he was written to be a jock, just kind of your typical jock character, and maybe he's supposed to be. A little dumber rather than ambig uh, amb uh, I don't know it's not ambivalent but ambiguous or yeah. not ambiguous I guess just eh. aloof? aloof that's the word thank you okay now, I don't know if I don't know if the aloofness was supposed to be so but you know what heavy-handed but I'll, he, I'll it's great the way he plays over, it so will I dumb jock yeah me too it makes me yeah. respect her more it makes me respect him more because it's just the way he handles things yeah and I buy them yeah. together I totally do yeah yeah <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just going to wrap up by saying, you know, it, it, I feel like, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but I feel like the the general, the public, the 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 cinephile slash horror community and the general public's this movie to me has its its regard has seemingly gone up a bit. I remember growing up as a kid, and it it would be just sort of regarded as it's it's it's, it's violent, it's trash, it's one of those trashy horror movies, and then. Oh. You get to, you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, it would get kind of lumped in with Friday the 13th and the 80s slasher craze. And, uh, you know, Halloween mm. isn't just a good horror movie. Halloween is cinema, you know, um, mm. which I agree. And I never, ever, at least through the 90s, saw Nightmare on Elm Street get treated with the same regard. Mm. But I feel like the people's perception of it largely comes from the depiction of the 80s genre as a whole mm. and also the sequels sure but i mean you ask any movie buff who knows anything and they'll tell you, you know that first nightmare on elm street though it's a smart well-written well-directed teen horror mm -hmm. sure it has some blood in it but i mean there's themes to dissect there's very smart choices mm -hmm. in the writing and directing and, and acting like this first movie like has the goods yeah um so yeah, I just in, in case there's anyone out there who who maybe isn't aware of that, I just I sort of feel that this movie's always been that good, mm -hmm. um, and maybe its fan base is understood. But I feel like in the last twenty years or so, the cinephile community has sort of maybe retro, especially when it comes out on DVD again and it comes out on Blu-ray again, people right. can kind of go back and go, "Oh man, that first movie really is good." Like I find I'm good. You know yeah, what I mean? yeah. Um, as a huge fan uh of this movie but also of the franchise we'll get into it but um <laughs> i i find uh i'm a little impatient uh with the way some people still do discuss this movie and this franchise because it does oftentimes get mentioned in the same breath you know like they think michael jason freddie and that's fine that's not there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that um i get it and i agree that said I feel like there are still people who lean into, especially when we're talking franchises, like entire franchises, there are people who are like, I don't know, Halloween's my franchise, or, you know, or Friday the 13th is my franchise. Uh, and, they, and they'll always kind of like give, or not always, but oftentimes it's happened enough that it bothers me. <laughs> Whoever is on team Halloween will kind of give Friday the 13th its due and then kind of slough off Nightmare, kind of go, it's never really my thing because, of it. and same thing, vice versa, like Friday the 13th team, Jason is going to like be like, but Halloween, blah, 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 blah. nightmare. And I'll always be like, ah, you're hurting me. Um, I just, maybe I'm just listening to the wrong podcast oh. myself, but <laughs> I haven't met that many diehard nightmare franchise or nightmare on Elm Street fans um, where I feel like, you know, a, a kinship. I feel yes. like there's, there's that kinship because we're horror fans. But there's also that, like, I have to watch my words because I don't want to. Well, you know, <laughs> you Freddie know? plays with, it, like, Jason and Mike Myers are both very human people set in very human environments that involve stabbing. 
Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, and I think that goes down easier for some people. Maybe people are less likely to give over to the fantasy elements of this movie, the more mm. fantastical ideas of how Freddy operates. Even though I feel like, pop culturally speaking, Freddy is very beloved. This whole series is beloved to a certain yes. degree. Oh, no, uh, yes, yes, within absolutely. horror communities. Um, I, I see your point. Um, but I mean, to me, I mean, I'm just speaking for me. This mm. is my franchise. Me too. Um, as far as slashers are concerned, like legitimate, as as like big franchises yes. go. Um, yes. I think maybe also, I, I, like, I was going to say, I'll mention this again later, probably, but I'll mention it now. When I, when I binged them all at the Frida, yeah. we watched one through six, New Nightmare, Freddy versus Jason. It's very jarring. And we'll get to it later, but I fucking love Freddy versus Jason. Having said that, though, when you watch one through seven, and then immediately go into Freddy versus Jason. The very beginning of the movie, aside from this little opening monologue, is a Friday the 13th-esque scene with this woman on the, the dock. She shows her tits, and then, and I, and I, and, and, uh, you know, the, the first kill is the kid in the bed, you know, fucking stabbed with a fucking machete. And I went, oh my God, this movie, like, this so is not a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Like, and I realized, like, so many of the kills are, drawn out in the series and kind of inventive and playful and fantasy mm -hmm. this franchise has never really been freddie going ha, 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 just stabbing right. stab in the blood and the blood also right. aside from uh the 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 kid in three forget his name the kid doesn't really talk he his dream, joey joey's dream involves a topless woman and then in four mm -hmm. top, naked woman in the bed this franchise mm -hmm. has never been about showing a lot of tits has mm -hmm. been about big stabby bloody stab stab deaths <laughs> so if you know if, if that's your thing this series doesn't really give you that and i became very aware of it when i watched freddy versus jason after these seven how much that movie has a freddy 13th element that is it's not the same flavor it's not the same intent i have a rebuttal for that but i'll save it <laughs> okay <laughs> well I'm only talking about the beginning. Uh, I mean, yes. maybe we'll get into this later, but after about a half an hour, it very much becomes an Elm Street movie, considerably. But it, the first few scenes are, are not. Anyway, <laughs> another discussion no for another day. Another yes, discussion. we'll get to it. <laughs> Any parting thoughts, Eddie? Um, it's just. Uh... I, feel, I, I think we've expressed this with uh, other movies that we've talked about that we were beloved when we were young and that are still beloved now. Mm. I think it's, um, but it's a real gift when you can return to uh, a movie or a series of movies um, that you felt a great deal of affection for before you could really even articulate why. And then you go back to them and it makes total sense why. Um, and the rediscovery of either new, maybe new layers that like uh, grant you insight into like why this particular chapter is still worth watching to you and stuff like that. Um, or even just like more clues as to, yes, these are more even more pieces of evidence that back up your theory about like why you thought you liked this franchise. You were right. You were absolutely right. It's all there. It like, and it's, it's there like, you know, by the ton um so uh yeah i'm just i'm just incredibly gratified to be revisiting the franchise again um and particularly with this movie because nancy is kind of my everything um it's it's just wonderful to 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 see her again that's all i wanted to say <laughs> as, as the kids say nancy is bay <laughs> uh yeah she's top of the list so yeah um we will be back to discuss part two so be sure to come back for that uh you can find us on facebook and instagram at movies we're talking about thanks for joining me eddie thank you john carlos whatever you do don't fall asleep